Hi, um, my name is John Bell. I'm the director of the Ballad Institute and Museum of Puppetry at the University of Connecticut. And we're really excited that director Spike Jones has joined us. It's a Sunday morning uh, in California, uh, noontime in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I am. This is a special Ballad Institute uh, Puppet Arts Forum titled Spike Jones, Maurice Sendak and the World of Puppetry. And uh, we wanted to uh, think about the way that our current exhibit, where the um, swing into action, Maurice Sendak and the World of Puppetry connects with so many aspects of Spike Jones' work. Our exhibition is on display at the Ballad Institute through December 16th. Uh, 2022, and um, we hope you might come and see it. I, uh, our perspective on Sendak in Swing Into Action is that although he was not a puppeteer, he understood the nature of puppetry's fascination with objects, images, movement, and music and text, and how the creation of those combinations, especially with a collaborative of artists, can uh, make puppets and objects come alive. And our exhibition looks at the ways that uh, Sendak designed, collected, and um, uh, collaborated with puppets and puppet productions from his childhood days, uh, making mechanical toys with his brother to his collections of 19th century animated and mechanical images, his Mickey Mouse memorabilia, his collaborations with uh, puppeteer Amy Luckenbach, uh, an American-based uh, puppeteer in in Italy, who not many people know about, and his designs for ballets, operas, and dramas, and uh, a, a giant inflatable for Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And then, of course, this direct connection with, with Spike Jones, uh, the film Where the Wild Things Are, uh, which is utterly fascinating. Many of us puppeteers were introduced to Spike's work through his 1999 film, Being John Malkovich, whose uniqueness and fascination is in part due to its interest in showing and thinking about puppetry, which is entirely unusual uh, for us puppeteers to see that. Uh, and in that case, it was marionette performance, of course. But um, Spike's other work, besides being John Malkovich and Where the Wild Things Are, uh, including Her and um, uh, I'm Here, a short film and uh, To Die By Your Side, which I just learned about, an, an animation film. Um, all of these routinely engage in the material world and performance as we talk about it, which is, of course, at the center of what puppetry does. In addition to Spike's transformation of um, Sendak's picture book, Where the Wild Things Are, into a full length movie, uh, his uh, documentary about uh, Sendak. Tell Them Anything You Want presents a revelatory portrait of Sendak as a deeply complicated artist in his 80s, looking back, um, and whose challenges in life emerged everywhere in, in his art making. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, our exhibit, Swing Into Action, is uh, titled that in response to something Sendak wrote, wrote in a 1964 essay the shape of music, which I think is really interesting. He was thinking about the relationship of music to his drawing, and he wrote, uh, vivify, quicken, and vitalize. Of these three symptoms, quicken, I think, best suggests the genuine spirit of animation, the breathing of life, the swing into action that I consider an essential quality in pictures for children's books. And I think we puppeteers think about swing into action as the necessary element in transforming sculptures and objects into puppetry. And we're fascinated by the way that Sendak constantly engaged in these processes, uh, first with his brother, Jack, and then with a series of collaborations with puppeteers, stage designers, playwriters, and filmmakers like Spike Jones that produced um, interesting puppet and object performance. So thank you, Spike, after my long-winded introduction for being part of this forum. Mm -hmm. uh, I, uh, and if I, please jump in if it seems like I'm talking too much. 
Well, uh, I was just going to say, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm uh, <clears throat> happy to always talk about Maurice. I love him. And so it's nice to just have the chance to reminisce about him anytime. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm so glad that you got to meet him. I think we met him sort of indirectly by going to his house and the Sendak Foundation and talking to Lynn Caponera and Jonathan Weinberg and just being in that environment um, and, and your documentary about him in the same place brings out so much of the richness of his work. Um, so I, I, to start, I've, I'm thinking that as I've said, puppets and performing objects appear a lot in your work. And I wonder how you see such elements functioning in film, especially in contrast to the work of live actors. Um, yeah, I'm sure all of it comes back, back from comes from being a kid and being, uh, you know, enamored with you know, the Maurice's work, it, you know, in the night kitchen where the wild things are. Uh, Shel Silverstein's work, fascinated by the Muppet Show, um, you know the endless thing, and I think just uh, the Pillsbury Doughboy, like right. just, like, um, and so as I got into my twenties and started making things, I think that vocabulary was in my my head, and um, and so I always loved the idea of it. I just seemed natural to the kinds of stories I wanted to tell to to use to that there is no difference between the the live action and some other form of you know of 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 a, of a character and so like uh I did a video for Daft Punk and we had this dog boy it was a dog head and I don't know if you consider those puppets but do, would you do you technically consider them puppets when it's a costume yeah, like I think of masks and puppets and then this larger area of performing objects. It's all related yeah, me too. Uh, ways that we communicate not human to human, but yeah. by means of a material but, object. Yeah, and take, yeah, taking some, yeah. I, I mean, it's funny because even when I wasn't, I never thought about this, but as you were talking about the movie Her, it's almost the opposite of puppetry because, and therefore it is puppetry. It's just the voice with no physicality. Right. And, um, you know, I, I've always been interested in that, that like how to explore hu humans and character in, in ways that are, even if it's robots, I, you know, that I did that short film, I'm yep. here and they're robots. And uh, it's just, I don't know, I love it. It's it, because it, to me, it just, it, it gives me a feeling inside. And I don't know what that feeling is, but it's a feeling yeah. of something that feels feels true and alive and moves me and, and makes, me, makes me smile. And, but yeah, the, uh, but um, yeah, so puppets, all, and it's funny, I'm going back, I remember Maurice told me, speaking of the Muppets, that, the original Sesame Street in the '60s was a group of artists that were pulled right. together by public service by public TV, and he was one of them. That he was in there with Jim Henson and all of them brainstorming on what this possible right. thing could be. They were they wanted to make a TV show for young kids. Do you know Do you know about that? Yeah, D Jonathan and Lynn were sharing that that they they had meetings early on, and even um, you know the uh, Sendex. Uh, uh Sendak's work he sort of sort of influenced um labyrinth I think so yeah, sure. yeah that was an interest seems like that was a really interesting moment where they also Sendak and, and Henson connected with this sense of objects and yeah um, and in, in your show do you have those toys that him that Maurice and his brother made yeah we have two of these uh mechanical toys the um uh uh one where um aladdin and another <coughs> that of uh, pinocchio that yeah. uh that they and they work really interestingly we you, I, when you look inside the 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 crafting of of the the engineering that i guess his brother jack did is su super amazing incredible i can't believe as kids they could do that and for for me like i i have a really wide-ranging interest in puppets and masks and objects and also the history of that 
going back to like automata and the 19th century where um, this German artist Megendorfer, who Megendorfer was part of that and his animated um, figures, uh, which combine uh, mass production printing with clockwork animation, uh, those seem really in line with those um, the pieces that Jack Sendak and, and Maurice made, these mechanical operations. You know, it's all that interest in making objects move and telling stories with them. Yeah. Do you, I wanted to ask you in terms of filmmaking, when do you, uh, how do you differentiate or work with the idea of filming humans, you know, actors, which seems so an essential a part of, of, of filmmaking, and then objects or masks uh, in, in, the, in the different ways you've approached that? Are, does it require different types of thinking about what the camera does and what it, the subject you know, is? On one hand, you, I don't think about it differently at all. And the, on one hand, I'm just thinking about the characters, the character the human, the characters of puppet, the characters, a robot, the characters, a piece of felt, it, you know, and, and it, how do I direct that performance? How do I direct that animator, direct that puppeteer, direct that suit performer, right. and get into the character of, of, of you know, get into the moment, the performance of that character. Then there's technical stuff that's totally different. Um, you know, but like, on Where the Wild Things Are, we have these giant suit performers. And right. what we did on it, I wanted to have the voice performances first. So we shot the entire movie with the voice actors over two weeks okay. on a sound stage. And everyone's just in like sweat clothes that don't make any sound, socks, big shag carpeting foam sets. So there's no stat, nothing makes a sound. So we just have all the audio. And it's all physical, you know, James Gandolfini is throwing Paul Dano around and I'm playing Max okay. sometimes and we're just acting out all the scenes physically, not doing voices or doing anything. I'm just being the, the yeah. character and um, they're hurt, they're scared, they're in love, they are um, want attention, whatever it is that is the character in that moment. And we directed it scene by scene by scene and got the performances and then took those performances and cut them down to voice tracks. Okay. When we were on set with the suit performers, I was looking for suit performers and a lot of them had never done suits before. A lot of them were actors. Right. Because I wasn't looking for suit performer. I, I didn't want like big stuff. Like, you know, you know, a lot of times with puppeteering and with, um, with suit performances, they, they're big, their voices right. are big and the bodies are big. Right. And you know, a lot of times that's because they're performing for people far away. Right. But when the camera is close, you yeah. don't need to do that. And so oh. it's like a you know difference between performing as an actor on stage versus in front of a camera. So I wanted the voice performances and the suit performances to be subtle. And so I worked with these, uh, uh, most actors, I think one of them had been in a suit before, but I, I, I found actors whose sensibility lended themselves to internal type performances. And then they had to learn the, the language, yeah. you know, like what, <clears throat> like the, 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 those characters couldn't shrug. It was like just one limitation. So right. they, they had to figure out how to sort of just, you know, use their, use, lift their arms and, and, and turn their palms to shrug. Right. And, and then that would have to become second nature for them to, if they were saying they didn't know, yeah. and tilt their head. And so they worked for, a, you know, a, a month or so with the suits, with the voice tracks. Right. And then on set, I, you know, I was directing them like I would direct an actor, like, okay, uh, more aggressive, hide, hide your feelings more, try not to make so much eye contact with them. Right. Uh, be nervous and then just on this one moment lift your head and look up yeah um sure so that the directing that the performances were the same but the methodology was just so complicated and even like the fact that they they couldn't walk like, like we'd have to sort of block we'd be in these forests yeah and we'd block out the scene without their shoes on and without their heads on so they could see what they were doing right we'd say okay you're gonna run down here you're gonna come here to the and then we'd have to give the set to the art department for 45 minutes for them to clear pathways and to make really smooth pathways where they were going to run. 
and then covered them back up with leaves. So they knew you couldn't tell they were smooth. It looked just like the forest. And um, yeah, you know, so a lot of, a lot, yeah, the, the methodology obviously is very different and sometimes super time consuming, like on being mm -hmm. John Malkovich with the puppets, really meticulous, time consuming uh, shots to do. But the intention was always the same. And, you know, that, that, that puppeteer is named Phil Huber. I don't know if you know yes, him. Yes, of course. Yeah, he's really famous in the puppetry community. And a lot of us know of his involvement with, with, with being John Malkovich. So Yeah, he, it's funny because when we were, we were trying to find puppeteers, we were auditioning puppeteers. Right. There's good puppeteers. And a lot of them were puppeteers that had done a lot of different things. You know, they can <clears throat> do hand performances or different kinds of things. And then somebody had told us about Phil. We hadn't, we weren't, we, we hadn't found anyone we loved. And then somebody told us about Phil. <coughs> and I was like, oh, it was night and day. I was like, he uh, is just, yeah. Just because that's all he does. Yeah. It's all he's interested in the way he thinks about the way he's been. He's had the same, the same, this woman, this diva kind of character of his, that he's had the same character since he was like, 14 years old right and he's gone through many iterations of building her and rebuilding her i think at that time there have been like four generations of her but like this was part of him and since he was sure 14. and he just uh was a true artist and once we found him it was like every everything just fell into place okay now right. i can do what's in my head which was what what's on film which is this in incredibly meticulous um specific subtle performance and everything and we didn't cheat everything was done on strings and uh yeah and he you know we spent like five days in a little uh garage in los angeles with like a crew of like four people you know and we, instead of shooting it on the big on set with everybody waiting yeah we did our shots that we needed uh cusack for during main production but right. then to get that kind of detail and to give phil the space and time and lack of pressure to get what we wanted. We had a, you know, we just had a crew of three people and just shot it bit by bit by bit. And it was over five days, we shot those sequences. Yeah, your your devotion to your, and attention to that marionette work is really so unusual. You know, puppeteers notice when puppetry is featured on films and the way that you pay so much attention to that and being John Malkovich is, is so un, unusual, and I'm I'm thinking maybe uh, it was unusual in terms of of Hollywood <laughs> film production. Uh, you know, did people say, "Why are you spending so much time focusing on marionette performance?" <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't think. I mean, the, the people that were making that movie didn't know what we were doing, anyways. The, oh. <laughs> that was the least, of, the, the least of their uh, things they didn't understand, but yeah. Uh, but, yeah, well, so much of your work has has such a a wide and uh, multifaceted a, approach to its subject matter, which I, I I think is so satisfying to watch. There's so much, so many different levels to think of, so many different perspectives Thank perspectives you. to think of. For I, I appreciate your your noting in where the wild things are that you recorded the audio tracks first with the actors and then the i i would call them puppeteers but you were you you calling them suit actors which of course is a, a normal way to think of that that they followed the 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 recorded sound and um and I, you know I, I, it's interesting to me i i know you're a choreographer or, and 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 a lot of your um work is about choreography i'm thinking of some of your um music videos um and uh the uh oh the, um what am i thinking of the, yeah, uh, the dance piece you did oh chris uh weapon of choice with christopher walken fat boy slim oh amazing and but i think choreography is let's see my question is is choreography with objects different than choreography with humans or is it all about the nature of shapes in the frame of the camera and how they move in sequence from one moment to another i think i mean yeah i think they are all the same 
it because they're sort of because they come they're not different languages because they come from the same place which is what does it feel like what 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 is what is this expressing right. what is this robot expressing what is this marionette expressing what is this dance performance what is this dance duet what is, it's what's the feeling and i think everything i i make and i know you know maurice was the same way it came from a feeling inside of him and he was trying to get that feeling out into these into whatever he was making and i think that like it's the magic of getting to be an artist and which is funny because even saying calling myself an artist <clears throat> i never would have done before i met maurice i would have thought it was really? too yeah i would i would have felt too pretentious but maurice really taught me what it meant to be an artist and what it means to allow yourself to call yourself an artist and the um and that like an artist he i mean I, I, <clears throat> he's probably said He's probably defined what an artist is dozens and dozens of different ways. And because I don't think there is a one definition, but I think um, you're working for a working, you're working for the art and you're working for the feeling that's inside of you. And that's, that's your job. And, um, and that feeling your, your, your responsibility as an artist is whatever that feeling is, that's inside of you, get it out and into whatever you're making into the book into the movie into the dance into the performance of the puppet and that that like and that's why and that's why it is that thing because if it was just a feeling you could say and express in a sentence you would just right. say in a, in a sentence but it's not like where the wild things are is more it's these primal feelings that yes. you can talk about intellectually but when you read it, you feel it prime, prime in a primordial kind of way, right? And um, and I think a lot of Maurice's work is like that. It's like, yeah, um, the uh, higgledy piggledy pop. It's so deeply existential. Yeah, and um, he's not. He's it's so he's so unafraid. He's writing. He's you know he has been called a children's book author, but right. he's he's writing about existence and and life and loss right. and trying how do you how do you how do you possibly wrap your head around losing someone you love yeah and, um and that's you know that's what that's what he did every time he yeah. was just looking for the way to express what right. he was feeling or what he was confused about what he was feeling and i think that in a lot of ways I was an artist already, but I don't, I wasn't, I wasn't ever calling myself that. And by just like him giving me permission to call myself an artist, gave myself permission to be even more of an artist. I think. Right. Well, it seems to me one of the, you know, one, one of the really um, innovative things you did was to, to, to say that kind of material, that kind of, uh, those kind of feelings and that trauma actually is something that kids is part of kids lives and therefore something that is okay to talk about with kids through children's literature yeah and, in, in, our, in our documentary he says he never he never believed as children as this separate thing that you right. know, that he believed that children you tell them anything you want to tell them if it's yeah. true and he says, if it's true, you tell them, you tell them the truth. And right. that, like, <clears throat> that kids are thinking about all this stuff. Yes. Kids are thinking about mortality. Kids are thinking about things that, you know, profound scares, right. things they don't trust, things that make them feel unsafe, things they, you know, they fall in love deeply. Like yeah. all of these things are just because they're not an adult doesn't mean they're not human right. and i think they have all you know we we, we are it's amazing because when we're kids we have all the same human feelings and so let's let's treat them that that was the one thing when 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 i was started working on the movie where the wild things are with 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 maurice i started having all the ideas about what it was going to be right and at one point i got really scared about how it was going to be different from the book 
right inherently but I, I was always trying to like make it uh in its guts be an adaptation like it, it feel like it comes from the book but it's you know it, it would it would I didn't want to add all kinds of other things onto it. I wanted what it, the evolution of it to come from inside the book. Right. Which, but I was still worried about how, um, how different, how, how it was going to be so different from the book. And he said that he didn't, he, he, he said he didn't care about that. He said, cause I was worried like oh, this book means so many things to so many people and I'm just making what it means to me. Right. And, um, and he said he didn't care about that. He said, you know, in his own Maurice perverse way, he probably cussed at these hypothetical people that were going to be mad, and um, and uh, and said um, that doesn't matter. He said it, he said it, it didn't matter to him. He said what he all he cared about was that I made something personal and something that was dangerous, like his book was when he made it, and that. And just like his book, he made I made something that didn't pander to children, and pandered to parents thinking of, you know you couldn't show kids something or other. And he said because right. his book was dangerous, it was personal, and it didn't pander. And when he w- and he wrote it when he was thirty three, and I was working on this when I was thirty three, and so uh, he he was like very, very very supportive. Like this is. Mm. That the book was mine, and now the movie is yours. And 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 Maurice, even at times where I would do something that he didn't like, like the the bedroom, you know, I couldn't. The bedroom doesn't turn into the forest in the way. Yes, it is. right. And I love that in the book. It's it's ironic yeah. because one of my favorite. As a kid, it's the it, I could look at those images back and forth and just look a page, you know, page to page and go uh, flip forth between them. But when I got to the movie, it didn't it didn't feel right to our the world and the story we made interesting and at first he was really upset about it and he kept saying but i it's your movie i have to let you do yeah. your movie and then once he saw the film like then that was when we were writing then when we started sending him the film dailies he you know we'd send him like you know an hour of dailies of just all the different stuff every week of what we we're shooting right and as soon as he saw the dailies, he understood why. He's like, "Oh, that's what the that yeah. that that my his idea from his picture book didn't translate into the tone of the world we were creating." And I say that only because he was always backing me. He always had my back, even at times where he disagreed with me. And um, right, he couldn't have been a. a it couldn't have been a more support i mean he was a producer it couldn't have been a more supporting producer but even more than that as somebody who was a mentor and um and an influence on me a huge influence on me i think about the way he was an influence on me before i even knew what that meant like right. at four or five years old as my mom would read me in the night kitchen or where the wild things are the nutshell libraries yeah he was influencing my imagination before i even knew it like the amount of time, the amount of time I would spend looking at the photo of the bull with the human feet in where the wild things are, and just yeah. be like, yeah, I didn't even know what I thought of it. I just couldn't not look at it. Right. And, um, it wasn't like when you're five, you're not analyzing it. You're just connected to it. You're like yeah. that. That feels like something. Yeah. I've never seen it before, but it makes sense to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then when you know in my in my, I remember it maybe around 10 or 12 pulling those books back out and you know because you put them away because they're children's books but yeah. then like I remember 10 12 13 something like that pulling them back out and being like hit by them again sure and, um and to probably you know as I started writing more short stories they were subconsciously in my mind mm-hmm. and then in my 20s when I got to make music videos I Early on, when I was making music videos, I started thinking about all those books that I loved, and thinking about if I could make a if I could make a video that's as perfect as In the Night Kitchen, or you know, or uh, The Giving Tree, or you know, by Self Silverstein. Yeah, that the, that I that was my goal. So and then you know, so he kept influencing me in different ways, and then of course, when he asked me to do the movie of where the wild things are it was a, it all sort of culminated together into this incredible relate and for me an incredible relationship and incredible collaboration one of the things the, the parallels between 
like Sendak's work in puppetry is this um, I idea of uh, tell them anything you want, this idea that children are, are, are humans who can receive all sorts of information. And um, puppetry for centuries was has been this uh, art form that connects to adults and children. You know, like if you look at pictures from the early 19th century at a Punch and Judy show, it's adults and kids, and they're all watching these shows. Uh, and, and also in, in Asian and African and, and uh, indigenous American puppet theater or, or performance, the shows are for everybody. And they include, you know, serious mm -hmm. ideas and troubling ideas and um, violence and politics and even sex in some ways. But um, th that struck me that that Sendak's approach to uh, to his work and, and addressing kids as people who can uh, receive such such information um, that has this resonance with with the the, the larger history of, of puppetry. So I, I appreciate that, and I think with with your work too, it's uh, it's interesting to see how you're, you're talking about. Um, how your work connects with Sendak's work, in in my mind, in, in some something along the the same lines. I wondered if you could talk more about how you um, started working with Sendak on where the wild things are, and you know, he we know from doing our exhibition because which includes three of the uh, wild things figures from your film. Uh, at at the Ballard Institute, we know from looking at the history of that that there was a long gestation period, and different studios wanted to do it. And then he, uh, there's a quote from from Maurice Sendak where he says, "Oh yes, Spike Jones. I I realized I really wanted to work with him." And I wondered what it was like when you uh, started working with him, especially because, as you've pointed out, his his story only is like 338 words, and to make a full-length film, you sort of had to build it out uh, in, in the way you just described. Um, <clears throat> the way we first worked was, well, he had asked me to do it before, and I read it, and I just hated the idea of having to invent anything. Like, I didn't want to invent some bad guys that they were fighting against. or Like, I felt like having inventing some plot that they had to go to the top of the mountain and get the wizard or whatever. I don't know what. And um, it also seemed bad. Like I, I kept reading. I was like, this thing is perfect. It's perfect. Right. And it's, in it, it's, it, 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 it's simplicity and it is depth and, and sparse, not simplicity, but sparseness and it's depth. And, um, and <clears throat> then it was actually the third time we talked about it. It was like, he asked me, yeah, it was the third time after over a few years. And at that time he was developing it, working on with other people and he never liked what he was do getting. So he came back to me, at, it was after my second film adaptation. And I was, every time he asked me, I was flattered, but also scared and like, I can't do that. And, but I just sat with it next to my bed and read it every night. And probably after a few weeks, I realized I just started thinking about who the characters of the wild things are. And I was like, oh, that's there. The, that's that's I I can explore that because that's already in there. I can just explore who these all these wild things are and the feelings they gave me. And <clears throat> and um, and that was my way in is just to like. Go deeper into what was already there, as opposed to inventing something wholly new and. Um, and uh, once I started writing the creatures of who they were, then it sort of all started coming together. And, um, and or at least my idea of what it was was coming together. And, um, and he loved it. He just wanted me to go for it. And, um, and what else did that make me think about when we were first working together? Oh, the other great, amazing, the other really exciting thing was, <clears throat> to build these drawings into creatures, as you see from the maquettes, they had to evolve a lot. They had to like, they had to become th something three-dimensional with right. fur and flesh and 
Right. And the process of that was so insanely hard because really? we'd go to these preacher shops in um, Los Angeles and either they'd make them more monster-like right. or they'd make them more Muppet-like and like, you right. know, and they'd either become kind of cute and goofy or monster-like. And I was like, no, they're, they're, they're subtle animals with, with, huh. with subtle expressions and, yes. and beautiful eyes. And um, <clears throat> we found this illustrator who had never worked in film before named Sonny Garris. And um, Sonny had, 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 I saw a, a photo of him had he drawn of a sad bear. I was like, oh, that, just, who drew that, that drawing? A friend of mine introduced me to him and he had never worked in film, never done anything before, but he just, I, st I had him start drawing stuff and cool. and slowly we, we he was adapting, adapting Maurice's drawings into the, the characters that are on, on screen, which is the character on the screen was basically what were in my head emotional oh, I, they were they're not specifically but the emotional the sort of wetness of their nose and the sweetness of their face but the dangerousness of their teeth and the beautifulness of the fur right and um and so Sonny would did a bunch of drawings then we'd go to maurice's house and we'd draw together and maurice would draw really? over Sonny's drawings and he's like no it needs this and it needs this and this is the you know and, and it, so it was really an incredible thing because Maurice it, it, you know he'd you know he, wild things were so precious to him but then he was being so unprecious with us he's like these right. are your wild things yeah and how can I contribute to to yeah. Sonny's drawings to help you get further yeah. it wasn't like he was saying the wild things have to be like this he was saying oh Spike you're looking for this kind of feeling in the eyes how about the, let's let's add these lines let's add the, the this shape to uh -oh. their their brow and um yeah, it was very, it was incredible. One of the things we've noticed in the exhibition is uh, Sendak's openness to collaboration. Like, first of all, with his brother, Jack, making those automatons um, in, the, I guess, actually in the 40s. But um, there's a, there's some uh, video of him going to the uh, Macy's uh, uh, inflatable workshop in New Jersey and the, the engineers and designers are working with a clay maquette of the inflatable of uh, one of the wild things, Moisha, his self-portrait wild thing. And he gets in there and he kind of like what you're saying, and he, he puts his hands on the clay and says, no, the eyes should be like this. But he has, you can see he has this real interest in respecting the work of his collaborators and having this dynamic relationship which is kind of interesting because otherwise, you know, and I think he talks about this in, in your film, tell him any, anything you want, you know, he's alone in the studio drawing, but he had this, had this real understanding of collaboration, which is, uh, I think something we as puppeteers are thinking about all the time. We're just putting together different art forms and, and working with each other. And I, I appreciate the way he approached that and seemed to enjoy that. And from what you're saying, he seems to have really enjoyed that process with you. Yeah, <clears throat> I think Maurice loved artists. And he, if he could, if he saw somebody who was working from an honest point of view, he loved it, loved them, wanted to support them. And like the, the maquettes that you have were done by a bunch of sculptors at Hempson. Right. And, uh, you know, with Sonny, sort of you know shaping them pulling them away from being muppets and pulling them into what the language we were looking for interesting and um but we do these video conference calls with the puppeteers i mean the, the sculptors at henson in la with maurice and um maurice you could just tell how much he you know each artist would be showing their their work and he'd be so in, in excited and there's a, the character in our movie named Douglas, who's the rooster kind of character. Yeah, uh, that's in our exhibition right oh, now, you, too. yeah. I, I wonder if you have the name of the sculptor, because the sculptor, when you look at the sculptor who did it, he, okay. he was making a self-portrait. Like, the, oh. the, he, he had his nose and his, the intensity of the, the sculptor's eyes, I can't remember his name, unfortunately, but he was, a, he was an incredible sculptor. And, and that was one of the characters that just came together so quickly. And I think it came together so quickly because the sculptor identified that like 
connected with that character. And I'm sure, you know, his boss was smart enough to say, let's put him with that character because that character just came, came, the other ones needed more, sometimes like more of this, more of that. And that one was just like, he made a self portrait and Maurice just loved right. it. Like as soon as, yeah. as soon as he saw it, he loved it. He could tell it was, he could tell it was came, it was pure. And, um, oh. yeah. It's it's it it's interesting in, in uh, your documentary about Sendak, uh, you show um, you know different aspects of the way that Sendak's personal experiences and acquaintances and family, and challenges and trauma, end up in in the work and and you ask you ask him if um, if a lot of experiences with your family wound up in your work and then at first he says no. But but the the film you make shows well actually it's all there and 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 even at another point I think he says that the Wild Things characters were based on his family or friends growing up in Brooklyn in in the thirties and and forties. It's interesting to me that your description of um, the the sculptor creating that character as a self portrait. Oh, resonates in that way, and also thinking of the 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 dialogue that you uh, created with actors for Wild Things. That's so sort of personal and intense and real. Uh, it seems like it's parallel to 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 this the way that uh, Sendak was inspired by his relatives in a lot of his work. Yeah. It's a level of realism in a way that m one might not expect from those wild things characters, mm. which are so puppet like. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one thing here, one thing I I wanted to ask you, um, it, it is about uh, a, a pup interpretation of puppets, and I I mean I, I remember thinking about this with with being John Malkovich with the um. The Craig Schwartz character, you know, uh, 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 a motivation of the film is that as a puppeteer, he wants to control other people. And then this leads to this wonderful, surreal world. It's just goes and goes. And it's so fascinating and fantastic. But one thing that in my mind is true as a puppeteer is that um, the, the objects that we work with have their own desires and possibilities. And in my mind, puppeteers are not so much people who want to control everything, but people who are always in a kind of um, uh, transactional relationship with objects and trying to figure out, as, as Sherry Lewis once put it, you know, trying to figure out what the objects want to do and sort of saying, okay, well, I, I can see that this object or this puppet does really well when it does this and not so well when it does that. And I wonder if that perspective of trying to figure out what objects want to do affects your work. Yeah, you. I mean, what objects want to do. I think you use, ob I think that like, I, I think even with a puppeteer, I think anybody or any artist or, or like an actor, an artist, an, an, a puppeteer, an animator, they're trying to express themselves. And okay. I think that like, they're trying to express, you know, but a puppeteer, you know, each one has their own limitations and right. a puppeteer is doing it through an object. So there's going to be the limitations of those objects. The object wants to do this or wants to do this, but they have to use how the object wants to do that to be able to express what they want to say to what they want it to feel like and like right. like watching someone like phil huber work it it, it yeah he he makes the puppets himself because he, he 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 knows how he wants them to move he knows what he needs to express it's the reason he rebuilt that diva character four times because he kept realizing oh the character wants to do this but the object doesn't let it do this so i'm going to remake it so its neck can go this way or that way right. or and so I think, um, but that's like a, an actor. An actor has the limitations of what their body can do. And then exactly. for a specific role, they might like, oh, I need to I need to gain muscle or I need to get really skinny 
or I need to learn how to use my voice in this different way because of the limitations of right. their voice is limiting them from what they want to express. And yeah. I think it's the, the, the limitations of the medium and what you want to express right. are always working against each other and working with each other. And, and um, that's what creates, that's, that's, that's the magic. I mean, if you could just think it and it would be, yeah. then everyone would make something incredible. I was thinking of this watching watching some video of your early skateboard videos, I'm, which I with I think you skateboarding and you on on BMX, and the way I think about it, because I think about this, like those objects, you know, this what the skateboard can do. It can do this. It can flip. It can you know, and what the BMX bike can do, you know, that what those objects can do with you or the other rider you know that's like this totally interesting dynamic because it's not yeah. like you can get the skateboard to do anything you want it's like you have to understand yeah that it can do, never this and do that. that i never thought about that that's interesting that in a way you're you right doing skating doing a trick on a skateboard is a, is a collaboration between you and the skateboard in the yeah. same way it's a collaboration between a puppet and a puppeteer or an animator and their, their, their model or, um, yeah, that's, it's interesting. I've never thought about that. Cause I've, that skateboarding and BMX always fascinated me because they were this one-on-one -on -one thing. Right. I, you know, I never really got into team sports. I, I appreciate them, but like this, the idea that it was you and your own limitations and your own it was your what can, what can you think of and how can you figure out how to put that thought into the physical reality so, so you're thinking of skateboarding as a thought is is that what am, that's yeah. really fascinating to me it's, it's everything starts with a thought and right. so, so yeah it's like and then you you, you know it, it yeah it's skateboarding all of it everything is 95 percent thought Right. It's the thought of the idea. And then it's thinking about how you do it. And then you do it and, you know, the board flips over halfway and you're like, oh, okay, I actually got to flick my foot harder that way to make it spin, do a right. full flip or, and then you're like, oh, okay, now it's, I'm above it. And right. now I got to commit to it. And so you're, it's all thinking and thinking, yeah, yeah. And thinking until you get to the point where you don't have to think about it anymore. Right. But yeah. um, it's it's yeah it's 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 hugely it, it just uh, I think just yeah. like any any of this is it's a thought right. that becomes intention that becomes action. Yeah, I think of that in puppetry, like you, you know, in sometimes you're uh, you're in a puppet, you're you're working with a puppet, and you can't really see, and and but if you're thinking about it, it gets to the point where it's kind of beyond thought. You can sort of feel it and. Like you can even do it with your eyes closed because you have a mm -hmm. sense of space and object in space and and sequence of movements in space, which is really interesting. Yeah, well, it becomes it just eventually at some point becomes muscle memory. Yes, exactly. And you yeah. don't have to think about it. Yeah. Um. Did uh I I think we were I we have time for a couple of more questions. I was I was thinking about um, uh, about Maurice Sendak kind of coming into um, illustration a bit, from a bit of an outsider position. Like he he didn't go to art school, and he sort of saw himself, as you can see in your documentary about him, in that way. And he his approach was really different. And I was thinking about your approach to film. And maybe I'm reading into it too much, sort of as a bit of an outsider, like it seems to me, if I'm not wrong, like you didn't come come from film school, but you started doing these really interesting skateboarding films and or, or and music videos. Do you do you feel like you're coming into the the uh, area of filmmaking from a bit of an outsider position? And is that something similar to what Sendak was doing? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, and I, mean, I think that's why we maybe we connected so deeply. And um, the yeah, I mean, I, 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 
I just wanted to make things. I was just excited to create and excited to imagine and dream up and I and to make things with people I love. That was really like if, if I was creating and I was creating with people I love, and that was what excited me. And I didn't know at first it was making skateboard magazines and it was making skateboard videos. And then it was making um, music videos. And it was just like the, the opportunity to get to keep just more opportunities to get to create and getting to do things I didn't know how to do. Right. Always put myself in position that of things I didn't know how to do. Like, I don't know how to do that, but I want to try that. Or, you know, I want to make a dance music video. I don't know. I never directed dance and never choreographed. And really? I jumped That's up interesting. It, you know, and did that and then made, you know, you just you know, wanted to make uh, a music video with a, do a dog uh, character. And I just wrote that. And it, it just like, I don't know, just, I always felt like, um, I wasn't paying attention to what everyone else was doing. I was making what I wanted to make. And not that there weren't other, like, you know, there's always other artists I was paying attention to. I loved, like, it, whether it's, you know, older artists like Maurice or musicians, David Bowie or whoever it was, or artists, director, like when I was making music videos, there's a lot of directors my age and we were all getting going together. There was, you know, and we were all trying to figure it out together and create together and, or not create together, but create and then show each other stuff. There's Michelle Gondry and there's Chris Cunningham yes. um, and the, uh, you know, Mark Romanic and David Fincher and Ro uh, Roman Coppola and Sofia Coppola and all these directors that we were all sort of creating around the same time, but not trying to create. We were all very different, did our own thing and had our own style. But we, we just, you know, I, I think like in that way, I... I I had a lot of friends that were making stuff, but I also did feel like I wasn't, I was outside of whatever the industry was. Um, in terms of, you know, not that I didn't know people in the industry because I lived in Los Angeles and that we were working music videos. And, um, but in terms of like what I was excited about, what, what drove me, I, I felt like I was, I was working from, uh, from an outsider perspective. Um, but I don't know, maybe, maybe everyone feels that way. I mean, it'd be, it's funny because even now I'm very established, quote unquote, you know, in filmmaking, but I still don't feel like an insider. I feel like I love making things. I still come from it from the same place and I, I get to make things in all different worlds. I get to go make live events. I get to work with musicians. I get to make music videos or documentaries. I get to put on plays. I get to create uh clothing uh things with my friends in fashion world i get to and then you know and i have ideas for movies or you know and so i come i get to come here to los angeles and do that and um but i still don't necessarily i, I mean i mean it's absurd to say because i'm sure you know if I, I but i don't feel like an insider i feel like an outsider and i'm, and I'm sure from somebody somebody else they would think that was ridiculous because mm -hmm. you know now been I've been making movies for a long time but I feel like movies is just one thing I get to do is is part of you know if you were thought to be uh, an outsider is is part of that like in because you're interested in these unusual uh ways of of making images like with characters who are robots or flat cut out um uh, animation figures or the wild things, which like, I feel like, you know, I mean, that's something that Michel Gondry shares, but I feel like in the work of say, Sofia Coppola, like, I feel like most of the films she makes and others are with actors pretty much straightforwardly. And I, and, and your work has these other things. I, I don't on. think it has to do with being that. I think it has to do with where it comes, you know, like, um where you're coming from where, where it's come where, are you motivated from something like purely inside of you like and so i think sophia's work is deeply personal and you know even though she right. comes from a family that's from film i still think she's she's an outsider she's not uh going you know she's not a you know inside the film business working from inside uh, you know and 
And I think that like it's more like where it comes from. What's what, what what's your motivation? What's what's inside of you? What, what's what's um what is uh what is it? I guess it's just a, 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 a working from that sort of personal place, right? Well, I I appreciate your expansive view of of your work and also your willingness and various invitations to bring puppets and objects in into your work. I wonder, do you have any other thoughts about um, Sendak and and puppetry and your collaboration with him and where the wild things are oh, that you wow. want to share? I mean, probably many, many, but nothing right off the top of my head. But yeah, uh, yeah it was great to talk to you. Thank you so much. And Thank you so much. Um, if, if you send this to us and send images, then maybe we have time to sort of drop some images over some of this stuff. OK, perfect. Send, you know, images of all the things in the show. OK, well, let, let me close um, by saying I, we really thank you, Spike, for being part of this. and. Um, uh, we want to invite people to come to our exhibition of uh, Swing into Action, Maurice Sendak in the World of Puppetry, which is at the Ballard Institute uh, through December 16th. So thank you very much uh, for watching.